I am Dooms Vince, and this is day 50 of Spawn Year. Today, something happened before my very eyes I never thought I would ever see. A television connected to a Super Nintendo materialized out of thin air into the graveyard. I've written about the torture of going several weeks now without seeing my family, without drinking caffeinated beverages, but I've also had to endure 49 straight days without television or video games. Now, I've never been an extreme hardcore gamer, and against the general reputation of my entire generation, I have been known, once in a while, to put down the remote control in favor of a good book. But looking at a rectangular box with bright colors and all kinds of things going on to scintillate my easily distracted synapses must practically be a train necessity at this point, because going without both for this long feels cruel and unnatural. I was honestly a bit surprised by my own reaction when I saw the TV and the SNES, but my elation evaporated instantly when I noticed the title on the cartridge. How could I have, for even half a second, fathomed I would be playing anything on this machine besides a video game called Spawn. Flashes of the greats hit me instantly like Tremor's Fist. Super Mario World, Mario Kart, Donkey Kong Country. This is all part of Dumas Vince's ingenious scheme to torture me relentlessly, giving me the things in the world that I cherish most and making it all spawn all the time. For me, the 16-bit era was the golden age of video games, and even knowing I wouldn't be playing my favorites, it was hard not to smile a little grasping that little gray controller in my hands again. Dooms Vince informed me that this Spawn game would, in fact, be my subject for review today, and that while I would have to chronicle my experience with it here in my notebook, this was also a special challenge. I would only be allowed to play the game through one time, with no instructions other than the basic functions of the buttons, and no time to practice. Everything else I would have to learn as I played, and though there are passwords for each level, I wouldn't be allowed to start back at any stage were I to lose the game. At this point, I was sweating, terrified that Doomsvent's plan to bury me alive if I couldn't complete the game in a single sitting. Fortunately for me, he seems more interested in prolonging my suffering. The penalty, in the event I lost, would be having to play another game against Doomsvents, sometime later in Spawn Year. He didn't reveal what this game is, or what might happen to me if I lost that game. It certainly seemed in my best interest, as unlikely as it probably was, to win. And his added incentive, if I was victorious, he promised to let me see videos from home. I still can't be sure what this place is, what's real and what isn't, but if I really am between life and death, and Doomsvent somehow has all these incredible abilities, I might see a video of my real wife and my real son. And so, I played Spawn on Super Nintendo, like my very soul depended on it. The first thing I noticed is that it's a great looking game for its age. All of Spawn's animations are clear and smooth, there's a decent amount of detail and color to the backgrounds, especially given the dark and dreary settings, and the foreboding gothic music is honestly some of the best 16-bit video game music I've ever heard. Even after living Spawn for 50 straight days, I was taken in a little by the ominous atmosphere. As the days wear on, I feel more like Spawn all the time, trapped in impossible situations that test the foundations of my humanity. And today, I almost literally had to walk miles in Spawn's shoes. The game does an impressive job of incorporating the major rules of Spawn's world, especially with the countdown clock, and that makes what could have been another dull, generic beat-em-up game a pretty unique experience. Spawn is, as he is in the comics, incredibly powerful, though I'm certain, just taking my best guess with no instruction booklet, I didn't discover all of his abilities. I figured out how to throw a couple different kinds of necroplasmic fireballs, and a move that's really difficult to pull off, designed to take out every enemy on the screen. These abilities, and running out the health bar, use up Spawn's energy and run down the Spawn clock. 
The game is very generous about starting you at whatever phase of a level you died on and allowing you to keep playing a part over and over until you beat it as long as you still have numbers on the clock. It seems to be designed to overwhelm you like Spawn is overwhelmed. I had all of this power at my disposal, but I didn't know how or when or how often to use it. I had to develop strategies as I went along for when to waste energy with powers and when to just use my legs and fists. It isn't just a beat-em-up. There's a fair amount of platforming, and even with a glide ability and being able to jump off walls, it took a minute to realize I could go straight up and I didn't have to go back and forth between walls, it's quite challenging. The game and the comics differ slightly in that here, as Spawn, you don't just sit in an alley and wait for things to attack you. Like some sort of a superhero with a sense of purpose, you actually go off and try to rescue children from a demon called the Mad One, who wants their souls, and that has something to do with this plot to unseat Mount Bolgia. Of course, one of the children conveniently is Cyan, but I'm not going to critique this story too much. I appreciate the effort in trying to invent an original situation for the action in the game, and I've read Spawn comics that make less sense than this. It is distracting how much of an effort is made to keep this as kid-appropriate as possible. Billy Kincaid is here, but he isn't an antagonist for the game. Can you imagine Kincaid as an end-level boss? He's the key to a doorway to hell, because I guess he's just that evil. Except the game can't even say that he butchered children, it just calls him a murderer, and it doesn't even use the word hell. It's called the Darklands. So I thought I was doing alright at first. Beat up some thugs, fight Overkill twice, who fires off his arm but not his head. I was disappointed. And he's incredibly easy. Stand there, block, hit him, repeat. After scaling a building and dodging some missiles and riding an elevator, I came to Redeemer, who was so impossibly hard compared to Overkill, I thought the game must already be nearly over. You have to time your jumps over this wide white beam perfectly, or it drains a third of your health. And naturally, he recovers faster than you do. He's much more agile, and there isn't much of a pattern to what he does after you get him off the ground when he's pelted you constantly with mannequin body parts? I fought Redeemer over and over and over before I finally got in a good rhythm and could anticipate his moves to get in enough hits he couldn't block without getting creamed. I wanted to rename him Cheap Shot. I seriously thought I was going to lose the entire game on the second boss and have to end this entry with I fought the Redeemer and the Redeemer won. As it ended up, I was down from 9999 on the spawn clock to 2303, and I knew the odds of making it to the end now were about as good as the chances of my ever craving a popsicle again. I'm actually proud on that low of energy to have made it to level 5. Doom's Vince later told me there are 10. I met Angela in a cutscene, whose face is entirely obscured for some reason, and who offers to distract Redeemer so Spawn can save those kids. I have to wonder why Heaven is so bad at keeping their soldiers from going rogue. And I did get to fight Violator, who looks a little strange and is, like Overkill, laughably easy to beat compared to Redeemer. I even got to visit Hell, or the Darklands, which includes some challenging platforming, a section that looks a lot like one of the spheres we visited in issue 8 by Alan Moore, and a boss who's just a big flame with a face. I certainly hated losing, watching Doomsvents gloat, and knowing something is coming, some new challenge against Doomsvents himself, looming around the corner, like a boss in the video game that is my bizarre existence. I hope he's easier on me than Redeemer was. But he did decide to show me those videos from home anyway, and judging by that demented grin, I was sure I wouldn't like or trust anything I saw, and that those videos were never really intended as a reward. Greetings, Hellspawns. It is I, the real Manos. I'm doing a video response to Captain Logan, this whole getting trapped into a coma because of drinking too much Mountain Dew kind of thing that's going on. Ah, oh, what an idiot. I can't believe I've wasted my time with that stupid moron idiot. <laughs> oh, well, this video was brought to you by my book that I self-publish and no one else. Normal is a four-letter word, which I totally wrote and didn't steal, and my name under my finger. It's right there. It's totally there. Anyway, push the button, Lindsay. Hello! You're watching Geekfolution, and welcome 
to The Dan Show, starring Dan. I am, in fact, Dan. You viewers out there may be wondering where Captain Logan is. You may have heard rumors that he's in a coma or something like that. I wouldn't believe everything you hear on the internet. Captain Logan is, in fact, dead. He's not coming back. Which is a good segue into today's comic. Today I'm going to be reviewing Ultimate Spider-Man number 160. Yes, I kept the poly bag. I am that lame. Hey everybody, this is Geeks Not Nerds. I'm Vince. And I'm Brandon. Uh, so, uh... What are we talking about today? I don't know. What do you want to talk about today? Uh, I got nothing. I thought I thought you had something. How am I supposed to know? Oh yeah, that's right. Who cares? <laughs> I don't even know anymore, man. I don't even know anymore. High five! Nobody gives a crap. Dooms Vince, you may think you're clever, but I know my friends better than that. Signed, Captain Logan. 